So ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure for me to be here. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here concerning Nam mm -hmm. So melanoma is defined as a malignant proliferation of melanocytes. Melanocytes are located in the basal cell layer of the epidermis, and this culture beautifully illustrates the uh, dendritic extensions of melanocytes, and those extensions are used to feed the, the keratinocytes with melanosomes. Melanosomes are all being the uh, keratinic genetic material to avoid incident radiation. Professor Boniver told you this morning already, maybe the figures are a little bit different, but I agree there are about 1,500 to 1,700 new cases per year and about 500 or 700 deaths per year attributed to malignant melanoma. Now there are several types of malignant melanoma. The first one is the superficial spreading melanoma. This is not the most dangerous one, fortunately, and it is accounting for about 80% of the cases. Then we have nodular melanoma. Nodular melanoma is much more dangerous because it's more difficult to recognize. This one is accounting for about 7% of the cases. Then we have lentigo maligna, about 10% of the cases, and that may be the most Traitorous one, that is acro indigenous melanoma. It is rare, but it is very dangerous. Superficial spreading melanoma, here you have a high power picture, is characterized by a horizontal growth phase. Nodular melanoma, in contrast, is characterized by a vertical growth phase. So the risk of providing metastasis to the lymph nodes is much higher than this kind of situation. This is Lantigoma Ligna. Lantigoma Ligna is the typical indolent melanoma of the elderly patient. And this is another example of acro indigenous melanoma. Frequently diagnosed much too late when the patient is usually already in a state of metastatic disease. Staging for melanoma is based on a classical TNM system and according to this staging we have a stage from 0 to stage 4. And there is a new classification from the AGCC in 2012. Now when we are looking at the survival curves of, the, of melanoma according to stage, we see that the stage 1 melanoma has a survival at about 15 years of 90%. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the stage 4 disease, and there the survival rate at 15 years is uh, near to zero. Again, this point was mentioned earlier this morning, melanoma incidence is rising since the past decades. It is not only true for the female patient, it is also true for the male patient. This is a general tendency and effectively in 2004 we have published a paper uh, stating these updating trends, these growing trends in melanoma incidence in Southeast Asia. Now which type of melanoma is a high risk melanoma? Stage 3 and stage 4 melanoma. We've seen this before. Acromantigenous melanoma, nodular melanoma, amelanotic melanoma. This one is the right nightmare of every dermatologist because it resembles nothing. And then we are over, since some years, more and more detecting the rapidly growing melanoma. That is the melanoma that is grown in about 3 to 4 months. It is a high proliferation rate and it is a very, uh, very difficult one in terms of a high rate of node uh, metastasis and systemic metastasis. So, as has been pointed out earlier, the most important and the only strategy we can have 
is the rapid and early recognition of melanoma. And it is the only thing we can do to help to reduce melanoma-associated morbidity and mortality. There are two main techniques. There is awareness, increased awareness in the general population and the development of diagnostic techniques. I will not go through these uh, increasing melanoma awareness campaigns, but they are highly efficacious. Um, there have been um, initiatives uh, locally, there have been initiatives here in Belgium, and it is currently spreading onto whole, whole Europe. The same kind of initiatives are existing in the US. Just to give you some clinical pictures, the majority of you may see those patients in the later stage, but we as dermatologists are frequently encountered with this kind of patient. This is a melanoma on the heel, rest of 4 millimeter, presence of local micrometastasis, and as you see, there are local metastases already present here. Here in our type of melanoma, breast of 5 millimeter, where this is a relatively thick lesion, micrometastasis and rapid growth. It is on the chest of an elderly gentleman, and <coughs> which is not the usual sight to see malignant melanoma. Here's another example. This is SSM type, superficial spreading melanoma. But this one is more treacherous. This is this plastic melanocytic nevus. This is not malignant. It's not a pre-malignant lesion. Here another one, this plastic melanocytic nevus, and the compound benign nevus. <coughs> now there are a huge array of diagnostic methods for melanoma, and I will go through each of these in more detail. First, we have clinical examination. Bioscopic examination is an easy tool. Dermoscopic examination, digitalized dermoscopy, <coughs> and smartphone risk assessment applications. Then we have histology. I will not offend Professor Bonniger, but I will not go through this issue today, and mutation analysis. So the differential diagnosis of a pigmented skin lesion is the first step to go. And this is also a major problem in training laymen or non-health professionals. Who aren't easy at once, is or is are readily recognized. However, spillus nevus or pigmented seboric keratosis and uh, other lesions that is like this blue nevus here, blue nevus here, and this uh, giant uh, congenital nevus. <coughs> the diagnosis here is evident. We are dealing with a melanocytic lesion. However, in a kind of lesion like this, you have to be really dreamed into detecting that it is not medicine. So in the algorithms of diagnosis, the first step is to decide whether we are dealing with a melanocytic or a non-melanocytic lesion. Once a melanocytic lesion is identified, then we go to the level two, where we try to see whether this lesion is benign or malignant or in between. So clinical examination, our eyes. The clinical recognition of melanoma is based basically on the dark lesion, maybe a light brown to black, but also on the fact that it is an atypical lesion. It is the ugly duckling. It is the one that is standing out from the others. A very important point is, and I think in our busy lives, we are not questioning the patients enough. You should remind that 50% of the melanomas that we are detecting are already identified by our patients. We just have to ask them about this. Then we have the risk factor assessment. Again, I will not go through these. This will mirror the whole morning. But we are assessing phototype, the number of moles, the type of moles, sun exposure during childhood, sun burns, that's a very high risk factor. The use of tanning devices is also the second most important risk factor currently known. The presence of previous melanoma, increasing age, the degree of sun damage, use of anabolics, use of alpha-MSS, 
uh, analogs, hormonal environment, PUVA that is used to treat specific dermatological diseases, is increasing the risk, professional exposure, familiar history of melanoma, live shirt exposure, people have more and more time, you're um, uh, going to world more and more easily, and you're not on the site. Just to give you a very small uh, time P concerning the major risk factors of melanoma. Here on the bottom of the line, we see that previous malignant melanoma is increasing the risk, but fair skin is only increasing uh, slowly, uh, very uh, moderately the risk. On the other end of this spectrum, we have the patient with a dysplastic venous syndrome and a familiar history of melanoma. And then the relative risk to the doctor may increase 100 to 400 times. Let's go back to our eyes. There are microscopic features. <coughs> so we are trying to see the dark coloration, light brown to black. Usually there are two or three or more different colors. That should make us vigilant. The second one is an irregular outline of the region. And it is usually more than six millimeters in diameter. And another very important thing is asymmetry. Then we have the clinical symptoms. 90% of those patients are completely asymptomatic. However, when pruritus, bleeding, ulceration, or recent growth are mentioned by the patient, these are really pejorative omens. This will say that probably the lesion is already in a more advanced stage. <coughs> then we have several clinic, clinical diagnostic algorithms. That is the ABCD, the Glasgow Seven Point Clinical Checklist, and teaching charts. The ABCD algorithm was developed in the early 90s, stimulated by the American Cancer Society. And it is based on asymmetry, border irregularity, color variegation, and diameter. To be very brief, you see that this lesion is not symmetrical anymore compared to the divine lesion. The border irregularity, the outlines of these lesions are clearly irregular when you compare this to a normal means. The color variegation, two or more different shades, dark brown and light brown, and then a diameter over six centimeters. So this lesion can, in clinical practice, not more repeated by a pen uh, that we opposed to the lesion. Surely we have to evaluate the efficacy of this type of this. The efficacy evaluation is, however, different and, uh, among laymen, so non health professionals, health professionals, and dermatologists. The specificity and sensitivity is increasing in this line. A very important thing, and I will come back on this, this one later, is the E criterion or the E concept. So when we add the E evolving, so that we can ask our patients is the lesion, has the lesion been changing or not, adding this E criterion seriously optimizes the sensitivity and the specificity of melanoma diagnosis using this tool. The Glasgow seven point clinical checklist is pointed out here. It is based on the presence of major features of a pigmented lesion and minor features. The major features include the change in size, the irregular shape, irregular color, and the minor features is the diameter over seven millimeters, inflammation, oozing, and change in sensation. And this recommend is to refer to a dermatologist or a specialized healthcare professional if the score is greater or uh, greater than or equal to three. Again, efficacy evaluation has to be performed, and what we have shown with the previous test, specificity and sensitivity is increasing among the experience of the uh, user. Various research groups have been looking at 
have stated that it is maybe easier for the non-health professional to use simple visual recognition. So this kind of teaching charts is very interesting because people are much more with the feeling uh, identifying what is malignant or what is not malignant. So this type of charts really help to increase the medicine. And again, specificity and sensitivity is high for most of As I've been telling you before, clinical <coughs> diagnostic accuracy among healthcare providers is increasing among the experience and on the degree of training. Cryoscopy is a very simple uh, test that we can perform. It is based by a short topical application of liquid nitrogen to the skin region. <coughs> then we remove the lens of the dermatoscope and we can observe lesions. This kind of test is very easy to distinguish keratinocytic, keratinocytic hyperplasia from the lancetic lesions. Here we have a beautiful example of a pigmented uh, verrucous mucus. And we see that we can enhance the clinical picture by using bias. Here again, this is not always easy to recognize for the less trained professional, and this can be mistaken for a pigmented lesion. However, bias can be helps very easily, very quickly. It's not painful in a few seconds to decide whether that we are dealing with it. Non so when we use this algorithm, we can already help here. So in the presence of a pigmented lesion, when cryoscopy is giving us features of severe keratosis, when they are absent, we are dealing properly with a melanocytic pigmented lesion. However, when they are positive, we have the differential diagnosis between a keratocytic Pigmented lesion or a verrucous to the mosaic pigmented lesion. Dermoscopy, we'll come back to this later. When dermoscopy is evidencing melanocytic features, when it is positive, you can also make this, this distinction between the verrucous to the mosaic pigmented lesion and subordinate keratosis of the verrucous type. This is the Heine Delta 20 dermatoscope. There are other dermatoscopes that are used. And just to illustrate how this is working, we are using a liquid glass interface. And that helps us to see very clearly uh, a huge number of features of the pigmented lesion. So here's an example of malignant melanoma with the irregular outline. We have this atypical pigmented network we have those gray, bluish veils. Here's another one with irregular pigment distribution, an abrupt interruption of the uh, pigmented network and color variation. And here's the last example, clearly showing the thickened network. Here, the areas with regression, the blue, which we don't feel. And again, other features as the uh, pseudopods, the uh, lesion is not symmetrical anymore, and the lesion is large. Now, using dermoscopy, we also tried to develop several different scoring systems. There is the pattern analysis, it was the first one, the most difficult one to use. The ABCD dermoscopic score, the three point analysis, seven point analysis, and then the Menzies method. I will not go through these, uh, all these patterns, but pattern analysis is divided in the presence of global patterns and specific patterns. And it has already been evidenced earlier that the uh, use of this type of technique is improving our clinical diagnosis. <coughs> For example, from small modular melanomas, we increase our sensitivity from 50 to 70 percent. Early lenticular uh, malignant or invasive superficial spreading melanoma, 
is in, in, increasing using this type of techniques. But it's difficult to learn and you need a lot of experience. The ABCD during the Scottish sports may be the most widespread and the most frequently used test currently. It is based on the same ABCD we are using with our clinical, with our eyes. So A stands for asymmetry in zero, one or two axes. B stands for an abrupt interruption of the pigmentation divided in eight seconds. The C stands for color. There are six shades that we have to distinguish. The white, the red, the light brown, dark brown, and the blue, gray, and black. Then we have the D. It is not a diameter, but here it stands for dermoscopic features that are the pigmented network, the areas without any structure, points, globules, and strips. And then finally, we can identify a total thermoscopic score. When this score is below 4.75, we are highly, it's highly likely that we are dealing with a benign lesion. Over 5.45, it's highly likely we are dealing with a malignant lesion, and between those two figures, we are dealing with a suspect lesion. The three-point analysis was developed in order to simplify this kind of testing, and it is a very interesting tool for non-experts. It's based on asymmetry, a typical network, and the presence of low white structures. This is the seven-point analysis, again a little bit more um, difficult, based on the presence of major criteria and minor criteria. This type of analysis achieves a specificity of 75% and a 95% and a degree of sensitivity. And when the score is over 3, it is suggested of the intensity of Menzies method, this is an Australian neurologist, was also developed in order that it can be used by <coughs> non professional um, health providers. There are negative criteria and positive criteria. And when there is none of the negative criteria and at least one of the positive criteria, then professional health is recommended. A fool using a dermatoscope scope remains still a fool. So it is very important to have training programs, but also to have evaluation programs. Digitalized dermoscopy is a very interesting thing. There are various types of uh, machines in the market. There is the Dermogenius, PhotoFinder, Dermite Photo, Metafine System, and the Australia System Solar Scan. The indications of this kind of machinery is clinical. It is used for a follow-up of high-risk lesions in patients with dysplastic aids. <coughs> It is a diagnostic aid for non-health professionals. It is also used in research to identify and to measure drug-related needless changes and hormonal-related needless changes. Here we see beautifully the evolution over time of a um, suspect pigmented lesion. Six months later, we see here the development of these horizontal outgrowth and they're compared with this lesion. And this was cut out and the molecular transformation of the pre-existing dysplastic means was added. Again, when we are not doing this kind of comparative studies, we are not able to detect this kind of uh, changes. Another one with patients with dysplastic needle syndrome, we can easily identify when there is a new lesion using this type of morphometric studies. It can also be used as a diagnostic aid. So the computer is comparing this type of lesions to a huge bank of previously recorded pigmented lesions. And then is finally giving us a type of score and again, when over time the cursor is moving either on one way or the other way, we have to be more cautious. Our interesting thing can be used to evidence drug related needles changes. Here we have a patient with metastatic melanoma. 
we followed these patients because we also presented a high number of dysplastic meetings. This was just a follow-up without any treatment. Then the patient received DTIC in this period. You see the pictures are not fundamentally changing. <coughs> At this period, the patient was treated by the polymonal. Now I'm sure that the other speakers will come back to this work later on. But it was curious to observe that the, there was a partial regression of these patients. <coughs> and here also, a partial regression of these patients. Simultaneously, the uh, scanning evidenced the disappearance, the regression of metastatic uh, melanoma in the lungs. Another interesting thing is to follow needles over time in during pregnancy, for instance. This is before pregnancy, and this this is before pregnancy, and this one is after pregnancy. Hormonal related changes are frequently increasing the needles diameter, the needles pigmentation, and the needles uh, general makeup. And recently came on the market these smartphone applications. Skin scan, the skin monitor, skin of mind, there are others that are developed early. And they are giving, when you are making a picture with your iPhone or a smartphone of a pigmented region, it is sent to an analytic system, and then you have a green recommendation, low risk region, a yellow or orange recommendation, a medium risk region, or a red one, a high risk region. And I will just go through some examples. Here we have a region that was photographed by the iPhone system. This is thermoscopy of the same region. And it gives a recommendation of a medium risk region. Keep track of the region and keep track of its evolution. This basically is plastic needs. So the system is working well. Here's another example. This is a pigmentary lesion of the foot. Picture by the iPhone, and then the system is sending the picture. It is evidenced here as a medium risk lesion. However, here the system is overscoring. So it is a false slip um, caution in the patient. There is overscoring. This is simply a benign, compact benign needles of the foot. These are good, another good example. This is the clinical lesion, highly suspect. The photographic picture and then the analysis, staging the staging is a high risk lesion. And this was the need to take malignant melanoma. Sometimes the system is fooling us a little bit. This lesion is for our clinical eye, and I think even for the not trained eye, suspicious <coughs> malignant melanoma. The system, however, classifies this as a medium risk lesion. However, it is absolutely clear this was malignant melanoma on three millimeters. Now we have people for a reliability assessment of this type of testing, and I want to go through everything, but under diagnosis, so giving a false negative answer is about 8% of the cases. And this is similar to our systems that are using photographic pictures of, uh, of pigmented patients. So we have seen that there is a whole array of diagnostic methods, our eyes, thermoscopy, thermoscopy, digitalized thermoscopy, and smartphone business assessment applications. This important array of diagnostic methods should our, should our provide the next question, are we getting any better detecting accuracy rates? Are the accuracy rates increasing? And how can we measure this? There are two classical types to do this. The first one is the number needed to excise, and the other one is the mean number thickness. And then we are looking at the evolution over time. In a recent publication in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, it was evidenced that in specialized centers, the number of lesions that you have to excise to have one diagnosis of melanoma 
is decreasing from 12 to 6.8. So they're doing better. However, in non-specialized sectors, this number remains completely unchanged. So addressing the adult patient, the improvement of detection rates in specialized skin cancer centers is clear. However, no improvements in primary healthcare settings and no improvement in private dermatology practices. When we are doing the same exercise for children, there is an amazingly high rate of NME. About 600 patients were excised for having one melanoma. I'm not saying this is the uh, anxiety that the patients have, that the doctors have, that the dermatologists have to fail the diagnosis of melanoma in a child. The other, uh, the other method to measure this is the mean melanoma thickness. And we have been seeing, and this is really uh, worth a reflection, thin melanomas, we are doing a lot better. 1.68 to 0.8 over 10 years. However, the intermediate and thick melanomas are not diagnosed, diagnosed uh, more quicker than we get rid And this may be due to the presence of the rapidly growing melanomas. We can also see the question in another way. That we'll see what is the frequency, what is the ideal frequency of melanoma screening. Certainly, this depends on a huge number of risk factors. We've seen this before. However, there are no evidence-based medicine data on a particular time interval. Now, when on a population system-based uh, based system, we want to detect the slowly growing melanoma. Once, when we do this once yearly, we have an adequate diagnostic performance. However, when we want to detect the rapidly growing melanoma, we would need every three months in control. And this certainly in our current health system is insufficient. So there is a kind of contradiction. The overall diagnostic accuracy is, however, uh, the global diagnostic accuracy is increasing. We are doing better and better. But on the other hand, we have the incidence of melanoma that is still rising. So, are we doing something wrong here? And what can we do to improve our diagnostic accuracy? The question that we have to ask ourselves is the following. Is the ABCD rule really helping to detect melanoma early? And this answer gets a definite yes. However, when we ask, when we ask ourselves the question whether this rule is decreasing melanoma mortality, then the answer is probably not. And this is probably due to the fact that ABCD rule is mostly aimed at the SSM melanoma, so the superficial spreading melanoma, but that is not the most dangerous one. So in my personal view, we absolutely have to adjust our message to the E concept, the E criterion, E volume changing aspects over time. And this is where these highly sophisticated machines can help us in specialized skin cancer centers. But the arrival of very cheap, widely available, easy to use systems like the applications on smartphones really can help on the general population to identify whether a lesion is changing over time or not. So what are our perspectives? Our perspectives is, are the following. Increase training efforts for our health professionals. Increase awareness of this concept of rapidly growing melanoma in the general population and among health professionals. To adapt or to develop new diagnostic algorithms to improve our diagnostic accuracy of the other melanomas that exist there. And very important to propagate the E concept to the general population and other health professionals. And this, in my view, is the only way we can help to reduce melanoma associated morbidity and mortality. Now, before finishing this presentation, I would like to go through a clinical case 
This gentleman came into my office with a fifth <coughs> wife. Those most people had a phototype two skin, so a very fair skin. They were blocked and had blue eyes. However, they were both exhibiting an intense and unnatural tanning. Ask if how this how they provided this tanning. They told me that they were injecting themselves with melanotan, that is an alpha MSH analog. It is available in syringes to inject this into the abdomen, and it is available as a nasal spray. Examining the woman, we did discovered a melanoma um, shown here by a clinical picture and on the mastopy. It was 0.3 or 0.4 millimeter thick, and it was pronounced. But asking the lady, she had this lesion for a long time and it had been growing since she was injecting the melanotan. So melanotan is a synthetic, is part of the synthetic analogs of the alpha anesthetic. It is stimulating melanogenesis. It is acting on the melanocortin time 1 receptor, subcutaneous or intranasal administration. And what is the worst, it is available without any medical prescription on the internet, on fitness studios, you can get this in spots, in tanning parlors, and what's the most dangerous thing and the most shameful thing, there are even our colleagues that are doing aesthetic medicine, aesthetic surgery, that are um, offering this in their practice to the patients. So from a clinical point of view, we should be very cautious when we have patients with a non-natural tanning and in my point of view, actions should be taken against the possibility of this illicit drug delivery over the internet. So in conclusion, early diagnosis of melanoma remains a very important thing in the fight against them. Increasing awareness techniques, whether it is the internet, media, the press, television, very important tools to increase awareness. The teaching of diagnostic techniques, the different diagnostic techniques, will certainly help us. And as I previously pointed out, a very important thing in my view is that we propagate and spread the e concept among general population and among the health professionals. I thank you for your attention.